Have you ever wondered what places in the Bible were so dangerous, so cursed, or so holy that people were forbidden to enter? What secrets do they hold, and why does God mark them as places of warning, from the mysterious abyss where Satan is bound, to the chilling valley of Hinnom, and the Holy of Holies that only one person could enter each year? These forbidden places hold powerful lessons for us today. In this video, we'll uncover the top seven forbidden places in the Bible, why they were sealed off, what they symbolize, and the life-changing truths they reveal. Some places were marked by God's overwhelming holiness, others by judgment and rebellion. What can we learn from them, and how do they still speak to us today? Stick with us until the end, as we explore these forbidden places and unlock the spiritual mysteries behind them. And as we journey together, make sure to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and hit the notification bell so you never miss out on our next biblical deep dives. We'd love to hear your thoughts, so be sure to leave a comment below. Which of these places do you find most fascinating? And don't forget to share this video with others to support our mission of spreading the truth of God's word far and wide. Are you ready to uncover the secrets of the Bible's most mysterious forbidden places? Let's dive in. Number 7. Jericho Jericho was one of the most fortified cities in the ancient world, and it stood as a symbol of human strength and pride. But despite its seemingly impenetrable walls, Jericho became the first city to fall as the Israelites, under the leadership of Joshua, began their conquest of the Promised Land. The battle was not won by conventional warfare, but by an extraordinary display of God's power. God commanded the Israelites to march around Jericho once a day for six days. On the seventh day, they were to march around the city seven times, and when the priests blew their trumpets, the people would shout. It seemed like a strange strategy, but Joshua and the Israelites obeyed God's unusual instructions without hesitation. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. Joshua, chapter 6, verse 20. Jericho's walls came tumbling down, not by the power of the Israelites, but by the hand of God. It was a dramatic demonstration of God's authority over even the strongest human defenses. Jericho was completely destroyed, and its fall served as a warning to the other cities in Canaan that God was with the Israelites. But there was something unique about Jericho's destruction. Joshua pronounced a curse over anyone who would dare to rebuild the city. At that time, Joshua pronounced this solemn oath, Cursed before the Lord is the one who undertakes to rebuild this city Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son, he will lay its foundations. At the cost of his youngest, he will set up its gates. Joshua, chapter 6, verse 26. Jericho was not just another city. It became a symbol of defiance against God's will. The curse placed upon it was a powerful reminder that those who try to rebuild what God has torn down will face serious consequences. The destruction of Jericho was not just about military victory. It was about the obedience of God's people and the rejection of a corrupt, idolatrous city. For centuries, the curse on Jericho stood. No one dared to rebuild the city, but like all warnings, it was eventually ignored. In 1 Kings 16, we read of a man named Heel of Bethel who defied Joshua's curse. He attempted to rebuild Jericho, but the consequences were exactly as foretold. He lost his firstborn and his youngest sons in the process, fulfilling the curse word for word. In Ahab's time, Heel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son Abiram, and he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son Segub. In accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun, 1 Kings chapter 16 verse 34, Heel's defiance of God's warning led to great personal tragedy. His attempt to rebuild what God had destroyed cost him dearly. His sons paid the price for his disobedience. This tragic fulfillment of Joshua's curse serves as a stark reminder that God's words are not to be taken lightly. When God declares judgment, it is final. Jericho became a forbidden place because it represented rebellion and defiance against God. 
Its walls had fallen by God's hand, and to rebuild them was to defy His will. The curse over Jericho was a clear message. When God brings judgment, He expects His people to respect His authority and learn from His actions. Number 6. The Holy of Holies the Holy of Holies, or the Most Holy Place, was the most sacred space in the entire tabernacle and later in the temple. It was here that God's presence dwelled in a special and powerful way, hovering above the Ark of the Covenant. This was no ordinary place. It was where heaven and earth met, and it was so holy that only one person could enter, and only on one day each year, the High Priest on the Day of Atonement. The veil that separated the Holy of Holies was a physical barrier between God and His people. It symbolized the separation that existed between God's holiness and human sinfulness. No one could pass beyond that veil except the high priest, and even he could only enter after extensive rituals of purification. If anyone approached the most holy place without following God's precise instructions, the consequences were immediate and severe, death. The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he is not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place behind the curtain in front of the atonement cover on the ark, or else he will die. For I appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. Leviticus chapter 16 verse 2. On the day of atonement, the high priest would enter the holy of holies to make atonement for the sins of the people. He carried with him the blood of a sacrificial animal which he sprinkled on the atonement cover, also known as the mercy seat, on top of the Ark of the Covenant. This act symbolized the cleansing of the people's sins and their reconciliation with God, but the ritual had to be done with the utmost care, as any mistake in the presence of God's holiness could result in the priest's death. He shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people and take its blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. Leviticus chapter 16 verse 15. The Ark of the Covenant was the focal point of the Holy of Holies. This sacred chest contained the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod, and a jar of manna, symbols of God's covenant with his people. The Ark's cover was called the atonement cover or mercy seat, and it was here between the two golden cherubim, that God's presence would appear in a cloud. The Holy of Holies represented God's immediate presence on earth, but it also served as a reminder of the distance between our holy God and sinful humanity. In the first temple built by King Solomon, the Holy of Holies was constructed with even greater splendor. The same divine presence dwelled there, and the same veil continued to separate it from the rest of the temple. The rituals remained unchanged, with the high priest entering only once a year, symbolizing that humanity still needed a mediator to stand between them and God. But everything changed with the death of Jesus Christ. At the moment he gave up his spirit on the cross, something miraculous happened in the temple. The veil that had separated the Holy of Holies for centuries was torn in two from top to bottom, Matthew chapter 27 verse 51. This was no mere accident, it was a divine act, symbolizing that through Christ's sacrifice, the barrier between God and humanity had been removed. The tearing of the veil signified the end of the separation between God and mankind. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, humanity could now have direct access to the Father. The Holy of Holies, once a place of restricted access and fear, had become a symbol of the open invitation to all who believe in Christ. No longer did we need a high priest to mediate on our behalf, for Jesus himself became our eternal high priest. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 to 20. Number 5. The Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom also known as Gehenna, is a place steeped in darkness and tragedy. Located just outside the ancient walls of Jerusalem, this valley was once a place of unimaginable horror. In the days of Israel's rebellion, it became infamous for the practice of child sacrifice, where innocent lives were brutally taken in rituals to false gods. 
During periods of apostasy, some Israelites turned away from the God of Abraham and began to worship pagan gods, including the detestable god Molech. In the valley of Hinnom, known as Topheth, parents would burn their sons and daughters as offerings, believing this would bring them prosperity or favor. These horrific practices were strictly condemned by God and brought about severe judgment on the nation. They have built the high places of Topheth in the valley of Ben Hinnom to burn their sons and daughters in the fire, something I did not command, nor did it enter my mind. Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 31 The valley of Hinnom became cursed for its association with child sacrifice. It was a place so defiled that it became synonymous with abomination and judgment. God declared this valley to be a place of destruction, a reminder of the consequences of turning away from His commands and engaging in such horrific evil. So beware, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer call it Topheth, or the valley of Ben-Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. For they will bury the dead in Topheth until there is no more room. Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 32. In later times, the valley came to be used as a dumping ground, a place where refuse, filth, and even the bodies of criminals were thrown. Fires continually burned in the valley to consume the waste, creating a visual and physical image of destruction and decay. The name Gehenna became synonymous with this place of ceaseless fire and judgment, and it is here that the imagery of eternal punishment began to take shape. In the New Testament, Jesus himself used the word Gehenna to describe the reality of hell, a place of eternal punishment for those who reject God. The valley's history of horror and fire became a fitting metaphor for the consequences of living in rebellion against God's will. Jesus warned that those who continue in sin without repentance would face a fate worse than anything imagined in the Valley of Hinnom. Number 4. Mount Sinai Mount Sinai, also known as Horeb, is one of the most significant places in the Bible. It was here, in the wilderness, that God called Moses to ascend and receive the Ten Commandments, the divine law for the people of Israel. But this was no ordinary moment. God's presence on the mountain was marked by fire, thunder, and the trembling of the earth itself, a demonstration of His overwhelming power and holiness. On the morning of the third day there was thunder and lightning, with a thick cloud over the mountain, and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Exodus chapter 19 verse 16. The Israelites, having been delivered from slavery in Egypt, had witnessed God's miracles before, but here at Mount Sinai, they experienced something far more intense. God's presence descended on the mountain in a terrifying display of His majesty. The people trembled as they stood at the foot of Sinai, warned by God not to come any closer. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. Exodus chapter 19 verses 18 to 19. The holiness of God was so overwhelming that no one but Moses was permitted to approach the mountain. God had set strict boundaries. Anyone who touched even the foot of the mountain would be put to death. This was not a mere warning. It was a declaration of God's unapproachable holiness. The mountain was now a sacred space, and only the one called by God could enter into his presence. Be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. Exodus chapter 19 verse 12 for the Israelites, Mount Sinai represented a place of divine encounter, but also of separation. God's glory and power were so overwhelming that His people had to remain at a distance. Moses acted as a mediator, standing between a holy God and a sinful people. This scene reminds us of the seriousness of approaching God without reverence or purity. Mount Sinai was a place of divine revelation, where God revealed His law and His desire for a holy people. It stands as a clear symbol of the seriousness of approaching God's presence without reverence and purity. Only Moses could draw near, foreshadowing the future role of Jesus Christ, who would become our ultimate mediator between God and humanity. 
Number 3. The Bottomless Pit The Abyss, also known as the Bottomless Pit, is a place that lies at the heart of biblical prophecy, representing a spiritual prison where the forces of evil are confined. It is a place of darkness and confinement, reserved for the worst of the fallen angels, including Satan himself. When Jesus cast out demons from a man possessed, the demons begged him not to send them into the abyss. Luke chapter 8 verse 31. Even for these evil spirits, the abyss was a place of dread, a prison for those who had rebelled against God's authority. The abyss is described as a place where the forces of darkness are restrained, awaiting their final judgment. The book of Revelation gives us one of the most vivid depictions of the abyss. In the final days, we are told that Satan, the great deceiver, will be bound in the abyss for 1,000 years. An angel descending from heaven holds the key to the abyss and a great chain to bind Satan, sealing him in this place of imprisonment where he can no longer deceive the nations. Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 to 2. For 1,000 years, Satan will be held in the abyss, unable to influence the world. This is a place of ultimate confinement for evil, a reminder that even the most powerful forces of darkness are subject to God's authority. The abyss is not a place where evil reigns, but rather where evil is imprisoned under God's control and awaiting final judgment. But the story of the abyss doesn't end with Satan's imprisonment. After 1,000 years, Satan will be released for a short time, only to meet his ultimate defeat at the hands of God. He will be cast along with all evil into the lake of fire, where he will be tormented forever and ever. The abyss, though terrifying, is merely a temporary holding place for the forces of evil before their final destruction. Number 2. The Cities of Sodom and Gomorrah Sodom and Gomorrah were once thriving cities known for their wealth and prosperity. However, beneath the surface of this apparent success lay deep moral decay. The Bible describes the people of Sodom and Gomorrah as being utterly corrupt, engaging in acts of sexual immorality, violence, and the oppression of the poor and vulnerable. The cries of the oppressed reached the ears of God, and he sent two angels to investigate and warn the righteous man, Lot. And the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. Genesis chapter 18 verses 20 to 21. Lot, the nephew of Abraham, was a resident of Sodom. He was a righteous man living in a wicked place, and when the two angels arrived, he recognized the urgency of their mission. The men of Sodom surrounded Lot's house, demanding that he bring out the visitors so they could abuse them, showing the city's violent and depraved nature. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Genesis chapter 19 verses 4 to 5 The angels warned Lot that God's judgment was imminent and the time for mercy had passed. The entire city was so far gone in its sin that divine punishment was the only answer. The angels urged Lot and his family to flee the city immediately. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot saying, Hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here or you will be swept away when the city is punished. Genesis chapter 19 verse 15. As Lot and his family fled, the Lord unleashed his wrath upon the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. The skies rained down burning sulfur, obliterating not only the cities but the entire plain, including all its inhabitants and the vegetation. It was a total and complete destruction, a divine judgment that left nothing behind. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. Genesis chapter 19 verses 24 to 25. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah serves as one of the Bible's most chilling warnings about the consequences of unchecked sin. These cities became symbols of God's righteous anger 
against immorality and injustice. Their destruction was not only due to sexual immorality, but also because they ignored the poor, the vulnerable, and the needy, living in selfish indulgence. The remains of Sodom and Gomorrah are believed to be near the Dead Sea, a region known for its barrenness. To this day, the cities are remembered not only for their extreme wickedness, but also for the swift and total judgment they faced. Their fate is a sobering reminder of the seriousness of sin and God's intolerance of evil. While Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed thousands of years ago, the lessons of their downfall still resonate today. They remind us of the dangers of turning away from God's moral laws, neglecting the needy, and living only for ourselves. We are called to live in righteousness, humility, and compassion, seeking to honor God in everything we do. Number 1. The Garden of Eden The Garden of Eden was more than just a beautiful paradise. It was a sacred space where God and humanity enjoyed perfect communion. Adam and Eve lived without shame, fear, or pain. But this all changed in a moment when they chose to disobey God. The simple act of eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was an act of rebellion that brought devastating consequences. The serpent, representing Satan, deceived Eve by twisting God's words, convincing her and Adam that by eating the fruit they would be like God, knowing good and evil. Genesis chapter 3 verse 5. They fell for the temptation, and with that one bite, sin entered the world, bringing with it death, shame, and separation from their Creator. God, who had walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, now found them hiding, ashamed of what they had done. When confronted, they blamed each other and even the serpent, but the consequences were severe. Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, and the life they once knew was forever changed. Banished from the garden, Adam and Eve were forced to face a world of toil and hardship. The entrance to Eden was guarded by cherubim, mighty angels who protected the sacred space, and a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to prevent them from ever returning. This was not just a physical barrier, but a spiritual one. Humanity was now cut off from the tree of life and the intimate fellowship they had once enjoyed with God. Let's read the scripture. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the Tree of Life. Genesis chapter 3 verses 23 to 24. The Garden of Eden became a forbidden place, not just physically but spiritually as well. No longer could humanity access the peace, provision and eternal life it symbolized. Eden became a reminder of what was lost due to sin, and yet, the story didn't end there. Though Adam and Eve were separated from Eden, God already had a plan to restore what was lost through the coming of a Savior, Jesus Christ. In conclusion, these places in the Bible are more than just physical locations. They are symbols of God's holiness, justice, and judgment. Each one teaches us valuable lessons about obedience, reverence, and the consequences of sin. So, how do these forbidden places speak to us today? What can we learn from their stories? If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more biblical insights. And remember, God calls us not to fear these places, but to learn from them, so we may walk in His ways.